Hello Heroes for Sale viewers, we're on the road, we've left our Heroes for Sale home in Liverpool and we're going to see Charlie Adward, the man who is behind the artistry of the Walking Dead comics. And we're going to see him in his home studio and how he gets down. Okay, right, hi. Well, this is this is where I work. This is the studio. Um, over here is, I suppose, my digital area where I uh, do digital artwork. Uh, this is obviously a good old reliable Mac. Uh, on the screen at the moment is a page from uh, Vampire State Building, my um, French comic book. Um, this is all digital. It's all drawn on the Cintiq over there in a bit of software called Manga Studio. Um, and uh, it's quite exciting. I've never really done digital to this level before as a complete project. So um, it's yeah, it's nice. It's exciting. It's an interesting way of working. Well, I always used to draw right from when I can remember. Um, I don't know what I used to draw yeah, when I was two or three or something like that. But um, what I do remember, and it's one of my earliest memories, is my dad coming home one night from work and behind his back he had a copy of The Mighty World of Marvel, number one, which was uh, the Marvel reprint of, I think it was, The Fantastic Four, The Hulk and Spider-Man, uh, the first time it had been reprinted in the UK. Uh, I think that was about 1972, so I was about six or seven. Um, and I remember just devouring that and, and loving it and just wanting the next issue. And it was, it, was, it was this great new world opened up to me. And I think because of that, I started drawing comic books as opposed to whatever doodles I might have been drawing beforehand. You know, obviously it wasn't proper comics, but it was just it was sequential stuff. And it was either superhero or science fiction or whatever yeah, genre I was sort of reading at the time. Um, and at the same time, around about that same period, um, I was introduced, unbeknownst to me at the time, to European comic books as well, because uh, a garage near us where my dad used to go and fill up the car uh, was running promotion, whereas if obviously you filled up the car enough times, you'd get a free Asterix book. And so uh, I kept persuading my dad to keep going back and fill up at the same place or get another Asterix book. Of course, obviously, at the time, I didn't realise it was French, but um, it opened up another side of my interest as well, which was obviously into European comics by, you know, reading Asterix books. And, yeah, to be honest, after those two formative uh, years, uh, I haven't really looked back. And was it something that you knew you always wanted to be, uh, you know, a comic book artist, that you were determined to get into that? It was probably a fairly young age. I do remember all... I don't remember not wanting to become a comic artist, um, if that makes sense. So probably at about the, probably about the age of nine or ten, I was probably saying, this is what I want to do. Um, and, and that continued up until I was, you know, 18. And then, then I was seeking other sort of, yeah... I think as most teenagers do, broadening your your minds, your field or whatever. Uh, but up until that age, you know, all the way through school, I was definitely, that, that was it. That's what I wanted to do. Obviously, The Walking Dead, it's a massive success. The, the TV show, are you a fan of the show? Oh, I, I like the TV show. Genuinely like the TV show. It's, it's, it's as good a job as they could conceivably do with it, I think, with the limitations that, you know, TV gives you as opposed to comics. And do you think that's been something, obviously, it's been running for a long time, 12 years? Is it something that, that you're still enjoying doing? Well, Rob and I have talked about an end point, and there will be an end point. You know, there will be. Um, when that happens is, who knows? Um, I want to see this book out till the end. You know, I've committed enough time 
to it now not to see it out to the bitter end it seems ridiculous to sort of bow out now and have someone else carry on no no I, I will I will see it out and, and Robert is committed as much as well to seeing out but I, I don't want to see it sort of just whittle away and no one cares that that's what I don't want to see happen with the walking dead yeah you know, I'd rather see us go out in a I suppose a blaze of glory I don't know or, or at least go out on a yeah you know, go out on a high go out before people have lost interest that would be how I'd like to see it and you know that yeah this we're, we're talking years still you know um because there is certainly no disinterest in it yet you know everyone still seems to be up for it and and what's good about the comic is we're not we're not, we're not going to dilute um, the comic by doing loads of spin-offs and everything. The comic remains just that what it is, just one comic telling one story, and that's how it will always be. So I think the strength of The Walking Dead, especially from the the comic side, is it it's not no matter how much success we're having with it, it's not changing the format. Does it worry you though, Charlie, that sometimes you almost get known as the, the British zombie guy, that you know, finding other work is harder? Well that that that's kind of the 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 curse of something like this, isn't it? Is is you get associated with something so so strongly that, that you are, you know, only known as the guy that does that and is capable of just drawing that sort of stuff. Um Believe it or not, before I drew The Walking Dead, as I said, you know, Robert just rung me, you know, emailed me one day and offered me a script and I did it because I was in between jobs. So that means I'm not a particularly big zombie fan, believe it or not. Um, I mean, I don't dislike them, but it's not, it's not been... I didn't think when I accepted The Walking Dead, I'd think, great, finally I'm doing zombies, my dream project, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's... It's a problem. It's a lovely problem to have because obviously on, on a series that's so successful, um, I can yeah, pretty much do what I want to in my spare time. Um, so what I try to do in my spare time you know, on other projects and things is do stuff that's so not horror or so not associated with The Walking Dead. You know, Try and get as far away from that as is possible. So to, just to show people that I, I am not just you know, a, a, a horror guy um because i never was you know it's just one of those things but you know i'm i'm sure that happens with everybody that's associated so closely mm-hmm. to to one single genre one single franchise or whatever you know i'm sure they didn't expect to, that to happen and i'm sure they weren't fans of that genre to begin with when they became associated with it but um Oh, yeah, it's open more doors than it's closed, that's for sure. Um, and, you know, financially, it's just given me the ability that I can do projects because, you know, in when I have spare time, I can do them because I want to do them as opposed to somebody's offering me a load of money for them. Um, so I can pick and choose whatever. So quite often I've done stuff for nothing just because I like I like the idea of it, yeah. Whether it's a one one off piece or, or a series or whatever, the financial considerations aren't aren't a factor anymore, which is brilliant because that means I can be purely creative. Um, I don't know why people regard comics as as some sort of lowest common denominator. Um, I mean, I, I am conflicted with the comics are for kids sort of attitude because, yes, a lot of comics are. But I also don't want people to think that comics are for just adults either. And unfortunately, it's created a, this kind of very close-knit fandom where, you know, we're, we, we are a niche industry, especially, you know, um, over in, in America and, and over here. Yeah, we appeal to a specific sort of person. And, you know, even the movies aren't really helping um, that, that cause. Um, so it's 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 always a bit of a problem. Whereas over in Europe, I think I think since comics ever became a known quantity over in Europe, so they've always been regarded as another art form, whereas they haven't been regarded like that over here. And I think because that's inherent in French society, Belgian society, whatever, um, 
I think it's always been held to a higher degree, a higher regard over in Europe. Fancy a cup of tea? I'd love one. Let's take it. Well, I feel that we're very much a team. Um, obviously, he does the bulk of the work, all the drawing and everything. And but I sometimes help him with a bit of design, layout, and we bounce ideas around off each other. I help with the um, the booking of conventions and events and. And I help with uh, some of the fan stuff that has become more and more over the years as well. It, it can get hectic and a lot of people leave everything to the last minute. Um, but it, you can't do any more than once a month just for the logistics, just fitting in family life, um, deadlines and his hobbies as well, yeah. of being in a band. That takes up quite a lot of time as well. He, he likes to have... Um, he, if he's doing a design thing, especially if it's a poster or a cover, sometimes he'll do two different designs which are slightly different and he likes to have an opinion of which one I like best or, or sometimes I suggest little tweaks and things that, that can happen. And We just work very well together as a team and he takes criticism very well. Over the years, the collectibles have gone to the edges of the home. Uh, when we first moved in together, they did take over slightly, but... Um, now and now it's all moved into Charlie's studio and into um, the extension and uh, it's starting to look a bit like a museum in these Lego boxes and in these cases. But, uh, and I do worry about where the next thing is going to go. <laughs> it's getting so full. It's amazing how The Walking Dead has, over the years, because I've known Charlie pre The Walking Dead, we've been together for over 20 years. So just how it's developed over the years, and I'm very proud of him. He's, he works so hard. He does work very, very hard. So if you follow me over here, uh, this is uh, where I draw The Walking Dead. Uh, this is where I physically draw. I like to divide the time between the digital and the physical. Um, here's a page of The Walking Dead. It's uh, just about halfway through at the minute. Um, I'm just doing the finishing pencils. I have a script down here, which is obviously Robert's script. Uh, all my reference stuff, Walking Dead stuff, which I have to obviously look at all the time. On the other side, obviously my pens, I'm right-handed, so it makes sense it's on the right side. That's pretty much all I need uh, for a page of The Walking Dead. Um, so yeah, so in contrast, it's all done um, physically on the page. Like I said before, it's nice to yeah, you know, divide the time between that and going to the to the the digital stuff. Yeah, first thing I did was uh, a strip for the Judge Dredd magazine, and it was actually a Judge Dredd strip. So it's quite exciting to know that my first ever comic book work was uh, yeah Judge Dredd. I had done a bit of work previously. I have to mention Tim, of course, Tim Quinn. Um, I had met Tim and Tim was living in Shrewsbury at the time. Um, and Tim helped a great deal. Um, and we worked on a lot of things together. And Tim and I had done a few sort of newspaper strips of various publications uh, leading up to the, the magazine work. So um, it just kind of snowballed after that. I mean, after Dread. I got offered uh, another strip for the magazine called Judge Armitage, which was the British sort of version of Judge Dredd in the set in the same universe, but he would worked over in the over over here as opposed to over there. Um, but that was a that was a series, so that was a ten minute a uh, ten minute a ten episode um, fully painted series. So that kind of took the best part of a year to do. Um, and then after that, a couple more black and white, smaller series. Again, I think they were both Armitage uh, for the magazine. Um, and then I got work for Marvel UK because of my work for you know, uh, the magazine. Um, and Marvel UK were going through a, a bit of a renaissance at the time of pushing a lot of stuff into America, though you were working on it obviously over here. Um, so therefore, my work got seen in the States because the actual you know, monthly comics were being published over there as, as, as they were over here, uh, which finally led to a bit of work for Defiant Comics, which um, was Jim Shooter, the ex-editor at Marvel Comics, his sort of company that he, he 
went on post, well, post Marvel, post Valiant, Defiant was the next one. Um, so I actually went out to the States for a month and a half and worked in its bullpen out there, uh, which was uh, interesting to say the least. When I was out there, I, I bumped into uh, another editor uh, who was working for Topps Comics at the time, uh, which led to work first off for Mars Attacks. I remember meeting um, the editor out there and we went to, went for either dinner or lunch, I can't remember, and talked about the project. Uh, so I did Mars Attacks, which obviously led on to the X-Files comic book because obviously from the same company. So, you know, these things are all sort of connected along the way. And, and pretty much by the time I was doing the X-Files, I, you know, I was, you know, established, inverted commas, in, in the US market. Um, creatively, it was a bit of a nadir for me because, you know, you realise what, what hard work and graft and a pain it is to work on, you know, licensed characters, especially something like the X-Files, which is heavily licensed, you know, there's there's a lot of people involved. So, yeah, Mars Attacks was easy because th- this was, bearing in mind, this was before the film, so... Or, or we were really well. We we were basing it on the bubble gum cards from the fifties, which were a property of Tops anyway. So and Tops had pretty much given myself and Keith Giffen, the writer, carte blanche to do what the hell we wanted. And the only other licensed character I worked on in that period was the Crow. But again, because that was owned by James O'Barr, and being a comic artist himself, he knew what it was like to work on licensed stuff. So he kind of, get, again, gave us carte blanche to you know, do what we wanted to do with that. The X-Files, on on the other hand, was, you know, working for the corporation sort of thing and, and all the stuff that that entailed. So it wasn't the happiest of time creatively. So I, I was glad to leave in the end. Um, unfortunately, what it did do was... Um, even though the comic was a success, um, people who bought the comic didn't really buy any other comics. Uh, so they'd go into a comic shop, buy the X-Files and Scarpa straight away without looking at anything else. So by the time I left the X-Files, I was almost back to square one again because I'd, I'd been out of the... In- it, for a lot of editors, it felt like I'd been out of the industry for two years. Therefore, I had vanished. Yeah, even though I'd been working, you know... Uh, diligently for the last two years on this comic you know no one was aware of it and therefore you know people thought I I was coming back in the industry again so it did feel like I'd gone back to square one a bit. So we have to talk about the man of success that is The Walking Dead people would like to know how that came about how did Robert get in touch with you and how did you score the gig? Um it's, it's no great exciting story really um Robert and I met through a mutual friend actually the writer joe casey um who i'd known previous and joe and i had worked on a few things together prior to the walking dead um and robert at the time had this very small uh, indie publishing company and he offered to publish something joe and i had, had worked together on that had come out by image but it wasn't finished off by image and we'd finished it and it was all there the complete series so Robert basically published the last three parts or something like that so I knew Robert vaguely through that I'd met him a couple of times at uh, San Diego I used to go to San Diego regularly m- more more to do a kind of a networking thing than anything you know I, I, I strongly believe in in that side of, of of doing conventions when you're still sort of trying to get the work so um and then I just actually got an email out of the blue 12 years ago now um, from Robert just saying, hello, remember me? You know, do you fancy working on this small zombie comic that I've been doing for Image? And I hadn't even heard of it, you know. So uh, because Image at the time were sort of in this weird transistory period where, you know, that they'd finished all the, they'd done with all the big, the big superhero nonsense that they started off with, you know, when when McFarlane and everyone broke away from Marvel and did the creator own stuff and sold the millions of comics, etc., etc., which put Image on the map. That had all been done and dusted. You know, they're all off doing their own things. You know, 
beyond that and um image had sort of in effect become this really small indie publisher um and i gotta admit my attitude to image then was like oh it's for image oh god they don't pay anything you know that was that's that was pretty much everyone's attitude yeah they don't pay anything because they don't sell anything you know um but robert had very fortunately caught me in between jobs <laughs> so you know i literally um said yes on on the base on the yeah he had sent me the comics i had read the comics i read the first script and i i liked it don't get me wrong but i think as most people admit the walking dead is a bit of a you know you need you need two or three issues before it hooks you properly if i hadn't been been two jobs would have i accepted it i don't know you know uh that that's the sixty four thousand dollar question isn't it but I was in between jobs, so it was easier to say, yeah, OK, I'll do it for the foreseeable. The secret, the reason The Walking Dead has lasted as long as it is, even without the success, is you know, you're invested in the characters. But that, that, that sort of comic book, that's just writing 101, you know. You write something where you invest in the characters. You don't write, if you're just going to write a zombie story where it's just attack after attack and splatter and gore and and that's your only the only thing that appeals it's it's what's the point it we would have been finished after 12 issues you know you have to invest in the characters so you know it was always a character book to begin with but you know the reason it's is it it's successful i don't know i really don't know i genuinely believe believe it's being in the right place at the right time I honestly believe that because there are plenty of other series as equally as good as The Walking Dead out there uh, that haven't achieved that level of success. And, you know, why? I don't know, because our concept is not particularly original. Um, you know, we had a, I suppose for argument's sake, an original take on it, but the actual core concept is not particularly exciting or original. Um so why people latched onto it is somewhat beyond me. <laughs> Godzilla. I don't know why Godzilla. I just latched. I love Godzilla. He's just, I, he's just, you know, you know, I love the, a lot of people hate me for saying this, but my favourite Godzilla movies are the 60s ones because they're just insane. They're just as daft as daft can be. Well, yeah.